Welcome to a Shot in the Arm podcast. We are a podcast about innovation and equity in global health, and with the premise that no one is safe, no one is healthy, until everyone is safe, everyone is healthy. I'm your host, Ben Plumley, and we're brought to you in partnership with the Bay Area Global Health Alliance, a network of academics, community organizations, tech, biotech, and other companies, as well as international NGOs, all based in the Bay Area and all committed to improving the lives of people around the world. Well, in this episode, we are joined by one of the founders of the New York AIDS movement, ACT UP, who later went on to found the Treatment Action Group. He's known for featuring prominently in many, many ways. But two examples, David France's award-winning documentary, How to Survive a Plague, and a documentary that was released this year and co-directed by a friend of a shot in the arm, uh, Janet Janet Tobias, about Fauci, which is called, well, Fauci. And he's also published his memoirs, Never Silent, and I'm making a shameless pitch for it here on the show. If you haven't read it, or better still, if you haven't listened to the audio version, I strongly recommend you download it right now. Well, we are, of course, talking about Peter Staley. Peter, this is such an honor for me. Welcome to a Shot in the Arm podcast. Ben, uh, thanks for having me on. It's a great pleasure. So look, in in this podcast, we're going to look explicitly about COVID and AIDS. It's a comparison I don't know that has been uh, fully explored. And I think there's so much there that connects us and divides us, Um, you know, from what we have done, what we haven't done, what we've learned, how different the coronavirus is from the retrovirus. In the two years of shelter in place, what has struck you most about the differences and similarities? I was struck initially by the similarities and, and uh, you know, was very triggered by the start of COVID uh, in kind of a PTSD kind of way. Um, uh, here we were, it was like, you know, here we go again, uh, a, a, a terrible new plague is hitting the U.S. and hitting the world uh, just as we have the worst possible leadership in place in the U.S. Uh, With AIDS, that was Reagan, who was uh, at that time considered one of the more anti-science presidents uh, that we had seen in our adult lives. And also he had gotten elected with a religious um, uh, majority of a religious base uh, um, who was, I think, the which fed his anti-science views. And uh, and what we ended up seeing was a, a non-response uh, for the first years of the crisis yeah. and an epidemic allowed to explode. And here again, we, we had a very different virus with COVID uh, where everything was going to be sped up uh, by a factor of a hundred, you know, everything is going to happen a lot faster because it's a respiratory disease rather than sexual transmission, um, and bloodborne. So, uh, and, and we had the most anti-science precedent in history, a guy who latched onto conspiracy theories. Um, and it's amazing. We got any response out of him at the beginning. Uh, and of course it was a very mixed bag where he was dragged, kicking and screaming, screaming to do anything effective, uh, and pretty quickly started pushing back against what his experts were advising, um, uh, undercutting testing, for instance. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I was saying, I was going, oh my God, uh, we're going to be going to funerals again, constantly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the PTSD was terrible. And sure enough, one of the first people to die was a famous gay man playwright, Terence McNally, um, who had written beautiful plays that had AIDS themes um, and managed to get through the entire AIDS crisis without serial converting himself, um, had, had lived this marvelous life writing about those years. And within a month, COVID took him out. And I was like, oh, we're just going to, it's going to be the funeral, once a month funerals again. Yeah. Um, and it was very triggering. 
I, I, I would love to come back to the PTSD. Um, and and if, if we just sort of maybe park it for a moment, the one thing hearing you speak is, you know, at the beginning of 2020, we had the um, University of Washington um, Institute of Health Metrics saying that the two countries that were best prepared for any pandemics were the United States and the United Kingdom. And I, I suppose the question is, did we really royally screw it up because of the incompetence of our political leadership, our malfeasance, uh, if you like, of the political leadership? Or, or, or do you think there was something else, something deeper about perhaps an arrogance and a lack of investment? No, we arrogantly screwed it up. I mean, we had real-time examples of countries that got hit before us that nipped it in the bud. I mean, this is the thing about new epidemics. 90% of what the political leaders have to do has to be done in the upfront, has to be done at the very beginning, because that's when you have the greatest opportunity to snuff out a new outbreak and keep it small. Hmm. I mean, you may, you may end up still, still having to deal with you know, a lot of work to, to keep it small from that point on. But if you're able to snuff out that uh, initial burst, uh, <laughs> your job, the 10% work you have to do later on is, is easy peasy. Um, and we saw countries do this. Yeah. South Korea got hit first. Their epidemic is, I think, their overall death rate from COVID on a per million basis is 140th the u.s 140th it, it on a, an equivalent but we've had 750,000 700 uh 750,000 uh, lives lost uh if we had south korea's death rate remember they got hit before us mm. but what they did is they they ramped up testing right away and they they were able to see what was happening during their first closure and because of it, the, the, they flooded the country with tests. The people who tested positive, isolated, and they snuffed out their first wave. We had and, that. We had the tech. They had the technology. We're fucking friends with them. I mean, you know, they're, they're an ally. This is not, not something we had to beg to, to, to replicate. I mean, the modern South Korean uh, economy was based on us their democracy was based on us their everything you know <laughs> vietnam but but peace <laughs> vietnam that, did the same thing i mean it's, but peace it's that, so frustrating but peter their attitudes to science their attitudes to the uh authority of government struck me as being very very different in this instance if the government says Everybody, we need to test, we need to hunker down. Okay, we'll do that. Whereas, whereas here, it was, don't tread on me, don't tread on my freedom. And um, it just seemed to me that in many Southeast Asian countries, I mean, it's not over by any stretch. And we're seeing, you know, third, fourth waves happening right now in Cambodia and Laos and Vietnam. But, but there was a, a an approach, a societal approach that was very different from ours. And um, I don't want to, uh, you know, I, a, a thunderbolt from on high will probably come down and um, evaporate me for saying this. But there is something about the messy individual driven democracy that doesn't seem to be able to to get an effective response together very quickly. Maybe it's good over the long term, but for the beginning, and AIDS is another example of this. It's the real example of this. It can go horribly wrong, don't you think? Yeah, but you know, I, I think we take those arguments too far. It really does start at the top. If you look at AIDS, uh, you know, we, we saw both the UK with COVID, we saw both the UK and the US 
mess up initially and, and not snuff things out right away. But with AIDS, we saw equally uh, right-wing leadership. We had Thatcher and Reagan, who were, you know, practically lovers. They were so politically what aligned. What I thought, yeah. And, and uh, uh, but she, she listened to the scientists, her scientists, and the country, uh, you know, there have been, we can critique that response, but she didn't ignore her scientists. She let them, they, they said, we've got to put out, you know, national advertising campaign to warn the country. And those, those ads are controversial, as you know, um, but they were all over television. Whereas the U.S., you had no idea AIDS was happening because the U.S. government decided to pretend it wasn't happening. And so I, would just, it, I would just and, give a shout out to the um, Minister of Health at the time, Norman Fowler, who, yeah. you know, one Tory, uh, one country Tory that I would never think of um, uh, liking or supporting. And, you know, here he is to the day, you know, sort of champion of the L LGBT movement, uh, taking it really very differently, so different from... Um, the Boris response and then the, uh, you know, the yeah. Donald response. Exactly. So it starts at the top. If, if uh, uh, Trump had go, gone all in with the scientific consensus, uh, I think his base would have followed. If he, if yeah. he made this, if he'd made this a, a, a mission of how we're going to respond as a country and, and fight this together, they would have gone all in. It really does start at the top. Um, and we saw countries all over the world, different political leaderships. It's not just the Asians are all, you know, do things together. We saw Norway do it together. Um, we saw Germany do a pretty damn good job. We saw Canada, right over our border, do five times better than the mm. U.S. did. So... Uh, this this stuff about oh it's in the American way of life and uh, that's fucking bullshit. You know yeah. we we were the ones that rallied uh, at, at, as a totally unified people to fight World War II. Um, uh, we we certainly have it ingrained with the appropriate leadership to to fight something together as a people. I and and another of it. yeah and another a couple of other things that I I, I think. Our positive lessons that come from the 1980s, that come from the AIDS response, is the rapid approval of medications or um, or vaccines, huh? AIDS vaccines, huh? To save the lives of people. Emphasis on that: save the lives of people, rather than the collation of the most comprehensive data set necessary to support a medication's safety or or usefulness. And you know, some of the laws allowing for that go back to the 30s, but it's really AIDS that broke those barriers down. And, and of course, us old timers always think of you, of Spencer Cox um, and Greg Gonzalez and others. But did you see the way in which you had beaten down the doors back in the 80s and 90s? The, 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 the success of that and the lessons of that were applied by the scientific community with, and the medical community with COVID. Definitely. I mean, we actually saw systems that we created during the AIDS crisis uh, being recruited and deployed in the fight against COVID. Um, uh, certainly, uh, almost everything that got approved, all the vaccines, all the tests, Etc. Uh, during COVID, were uh, approved using uh, emergency use authorization, which is a, con a, a contemporary construct, but very much based on uh, accelerator, accelerated approval, which uh, came about during the AIDS years. And uh, accelerated approval looks very much like uh, uh, EUA, emergency yeah. use authorization, in the sense that you, you get, it's not a full approval, it, it's a way to get out quicker, but you have to make promises to do ongoing trials that get you final approval. And uh, so it's basically the same bird, 
and it was created during AIDS. Um, and then uh, all the way down to the clinical trial system that was set up for AIDS uh, at the NIH called the AIDS Clinical Trials Group, the ACTG. Um, AIDS activists, uh, we went to war with Tony Fauci and the NIH to make that network more responsive. It, it, it initially, it was just testing AZT and, uh, up the wazoo and not looking at new drugs and not looking at the opportunistic infections and, and uh, shamefully not doing a very good job of enrolling uh, the full diversity of patients with HIV in the clinical trial system. So we pushed it to do better on that, on those issues. And by 1995, they were doing an incredible job enrolling people of color and women into clinical trials, such that when Moderna's vaccine was being studied in 2020, and they encountered problems in rolling enough uh, African Americans in to get uh, mm -hmm. statistically significant numbers to analyze. The ACTG was put into service for Moderna <laughs> <laughs> in order to enroll enough people of color, and the ACTG fixed Moderna's problem, and we thus had enough data on the drug on the vaccine in, in people of color. And we're able to get an emergency use authorization for all groups. Do you know, it, it's it's really funny you say that um, in a a sister podcast that we do called Vax Up about the tools that vaccine implementers can use to fight misinformation. We had, uh, I guess, he was a, a former member of ACTG, Dr. George Woods, who um, uh, African American uh, psychiatrist based out in Oakland, but is now doing trainings with African-American com community groups from Chicago to Oakland to wherever. So like, guys, we are in these trials. We are in the studies. They haven't left us out. And you need to understand and embrace that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, but it, it, it also is interesting to me that the, uh, the battle that you had with the NIH in the 80s is so different from what activism um, against the NIH is now. Right. Could you share a little bit, and again, this comes from the book, Never Silent. Can, can you talk about the um, historic uh, protest at uh, NIH? Yeah. Um, well, we, you know, when ACT UP started, our first target was the FDA, uh, which was an considered the most entrenched agency in, in all of Washington. Uh, they did things their way and everyone else could take a hike. Um, and it was very slow and methodical. It would take upwards of 10 years to get a drug approved. And they were not nimble when it came to uh, life-threatening illnesses, uh, major killers. And uh, so ACT UP targeted the FDA um, and to our surprise, at, especially right after our huge demonstration in late 88, uh, where we shut down the FDA for a day, to our surprise, uh, we found an ally on some of our critique, critiques of the FDA in none other than Dr. Anthony Fauci uh, over at NIH. He was the young uh, somewhat new director of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He was in charge of the AIDS research effort at the NIH. And uh, he, he shared some of our frustrations with the FDA. Mm -hmm. So our first relationships with him were actually uh, using each other. Uh, he agreed to push the FDA on, on major things we wanted changed there. And his endorsement of some of the things we were doing, especially Parallel Track. Uh, Parallel Track was a system of getting everyone who isn't in the late stage clinical trials, giving them access to these drugs before they're approved. Um, he endorsed that. And nine months after the, the huge demonstration at the FDA, we had won almost everything we wanted because Fauci, with a heavy lift from Tony Fauci. 
So the relationship started with this synergy, um, and we're like, okay, great. And then we pivoted. <laughs> we're like, okay, FDA solved. Now we have to fix what's going on at the NIH. And we had major problems with uh, how he was running the eighth clinical trials group. And we started raising all these issues. And uh, he was very slow to respond to most of our critiques. Um, and so we had to keep upping the pressure. And that resulted a year later in a gigantic demonstration at the NIH, very much replicating what we had done at the FDA. Um, and there you are on the, <laughs> uh, on the front hall roof of uh, NIH being pulled down by these hot cops. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, and then there you are being handcuffed, walked through the halls, and you bump into Tony, and it's like, oh, hey, Peter. Hi, Tony. Uh, <laughs> incredible. Yeah, it was, it was some dumb luck that day, but uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was an absolutely hysterical moment that, I mean, they, you know, they got me off. I wanted to be the first arrest, so I got up on the overhang, uh, passed all the cops, and uh, they were furious. And they yanked me off of there uh, pretty violently. And, and, uh, but they were surrounded by a thousand demonstrators. And it's like, how do we get him into the police vans that are behind the building? So they decided to walk me through uh, NIAD, Building 31, where Tony worked. Uh, and it just so happened he was walking down the hall while they were pulling me through the ground floor level. Um, and I, I'm handcuffed. <laughs> with a big uh, burly uh, police officer yanking me down the hall by my elbow. And I see him <laughs> and that, that familiar short guy with a white coat. Uh, and I go, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, Peter? <laughs> and the cop is looking at me like, who the hell is this? <laughs> who, who have I arrested? That he knows the guy who runs this building. To help me prepare, Peter, I was talking to Julian Howes yesterday, who's now in Amsterdam, and he and uh, John Campbell made me go to some of London's first ACT UP meetings. And John Campbell's instructions to me were just to sit at the back, not make myself, don't say anything, don't be a problem, put your headphones on, listen to Abba Gold, and when I point to you, then start shouting. <laughs> See, this, this is so interesting. So, uh, you know, 1990, ACT UP's um, demonstration there. Four young activists in the UK, you know, struggling with, with whether something like an ACT UP was right for us. It, it turned out that it wasn't right for me, and I went to the Terence Higgins Trust. Mm -hmm. But we, so what I've just reported to you, what the story I've told is in many ways different. Um, and it just, it, it, it's so interesting to me about the importance of documenting what actually happened. And um, th there's a value in having you know, different perspectives on stories. But I, I just wonder, again, here we are in the middle of COVID. Had you planned to write Never Silent about this time? Or was it simply because you were, you and Stella, your dog, were just stuck in the apartment and needed something to do? I Well, I actually started writing it uh, three years ago. And... Uh... Very reluctantly. <laughs> People had been suggesting that I do so for years. Uh, and I was up against a couple things keeping me from, from doing it. Uh, the biggest of which is that I actually have a lifetime hatred of the process of writing. I, I really loathe it. Um, I'm open about that. I, I just, I just, I despise it. I picked careers to avoid writing like bond trading on wall street you don't have to write <laughs> you know? and i ended up being the least prolific uh of the aids activists during act up and tag you know mark harrington would write 
write an op-ed or an article once a month somewhere. Just write, write, write. And Greg Gonzalez is a great writer and mm-hmm. on and on. And you'll, you'll find very few published pieces from Peter Staley because <laughs> I just hate writing. So I was up against that. But the, the thing that yanked me into it and convinced me to give it a try is was the constant stream of responses that really hadn't died down from How to Survive a Plague, the documentary, where I was getting pinged initially every day, uh, multiple times a day, after the movie came out. And uh, even uh, up until today, at least on a, a couple times a month still, someone reaches out to me via, via social media, uh, via private message on, on any of the social media platforms mm-hmm. I'm on, that they, they've just seen the film and they find me online and, and they tell me just how it changes their life and how inspired they are. Quite a few of these individuals I stayed in contact with, uh, I'm talking dozens, mm-hmm. and quite a few have gone on to work in activism. They've become activists or they've worked in, they've, they, they, and all, almost all of them were young people or they went into uh, med- uh, the medical profession, they, they wanted to become researchers or doctors, uh, or go into other movements. And uh, those stories just blew me away. Yeah. Um, the, the ability of, of these narratives to inspire others to uh, uh, pursue a life of, of trying to change the world for the better, um, and it's it's interesting me to me, Tony. I, I, I also have a Peter. real problem with writing. I did I do that? Yes. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> look at that! I am in so much deep water. But hey, what the hell? Tony, so Peter, good, uh, <laughs> we, were, we were just we were just talking about him. So. Right, right. Um, I have a real problem writing, and so I have found podcasts to be uh, podcasts and oral histories, the way for me to make sense of what happened over those Mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And again, I would never, ever have guessed this. Um, But I think one, and it's also a way to balance um, the need for formal documentation with, with storytelling, which I think is much more important in changing um, minds and hearts, but but I, I, to the extent you're comfortable, could you talk about the evolution of your friendship with Tony Fauci? Um, you know, from foe to friend, and and how you feel he's coped with these two years of COVID. And and I ask that because I feel for the sort of uh, wishy washy West Coast liberals who really couldn't give, you know, can't care less. I, I think we need to be standing up more and r- really speaking out on behalf and supporting these clinical and scientific leaders who essentially saved so many of us in COVID. Exactly. And, and um, uh, well, the friendship kind of started pretty much from the get-go. I, I you know, I, I was wowed by him. He is a from a personality perspective, he is a force of nature. Uh, <laughs> he's very, very congenial, upbeat, um, brilliant, but doesn't speak down to people at all. He doesn't make you feel stupid. Yeah. Um, he kind of, he, he brings people up a learning curve with him uh, in, a, in an incredibly embracing, friendly way. Um, and... Uh, there's a decency to the man that you you can uh, definitely pick up on from the first minutes you meet him um, that uh, uh, I, is very touching, frankly. He, uh, I don't know if it's... It, I, he pins a lot of it to his upbringing, his parents, and uh, his Jesuit schooling um, of always wanting to just give back. Um, mm. But uh, so on a personal level, I liked him from the get-go. I knew he cared about AIDS. Uh, 
I began to learn what his faults were early on, and uh, like all of us, you know, uh, from the Pope on down, we've all got faults, and um, uh, he certainly has his share, and I think I know his faults better than almost anybody uh, on the planet, maybe maybe, maybe excepting his wife, Chris. Mm. Um, uh, and one of the amazing things is our friendship evolved over the decades was that um, uh, from, you know, because I was in ACT UP and we were always pushing him, uh, I got into the practice of being very upfront with him about what I thought he was doing wrong. I, I could mm. tell him, I could say these things right to his face or right over the phone, very, very bluntly. And to my surprise, he had this very rare ability of actually not pushing, you know, emotionally walling up like a lot of us do, uh, mm -hmm. getting defensive uh, or pulling away, uh, especially if, if the, the critique is really, really blunt. Um, in fact, uh, our friendship got tighter. Uh, and that, you know, let's call this what it is. That's that's an, a, a remarkable asset of his, yeah. um, uh, that he embraces uh, a, a friendship uh, that is that, <laughs> you know, that intense. So when COVID hit, I thought he was making, you know, first off, I thought he was doing what he does best as, as well as he could, as well as he always has, and it was much needed at the time. Um, I think his ability, along with Deborah Burks, to convince Trump with two key Oval Office visits in March and April of 2020 mm -hmm. to uh, shut down the country and, and then maintain that shutdown past Easter um, uh, definitely saved uh, over half a million lives. Um, all the modeling uh, showed that. We were looking at upwards of a million deaths by the summer of 2020 if we had not shut down and tried to bend down that first wave. Uh, all the modeling since then has shown that that is in fact what was saved. Um, so we ended up with 150,000 deaths by the end of June, uh, and that could have been close to a million. So uh, those two key meetings or what he has always done well with presidents, convincing them to do the right thing. But we knew that that wouldn't last. We knew that Trump was crazy. We knew his base was crazy. And at some point he was going to turn. And, it, you know, after that second Oval Office meeting, he was already turning in his own head. And he turned against Fauci in a big way. Um, and at that point, my relationship with Tony... Uh, became one as kind of a key political advisor on how to survive the Trump White House. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it was a surprise. It was actually a, a big surprise to me. I, I, I reached out in January, February, knowing he was, you know, in this crazy White House and overloaded, seeing him on, on the TV every night. And I just said, are you holding up? You know, I I texted him just out of concern because uh, and our first conversation and he would call me actually he'd say I'll call you right back this would be on his drive from the mm -hmm. White House back to back to the office or back home and he really wanted to vent about what had just happened uh, that afternoon um, uh, so I listened and I said well do you want to hear do you want to hear what I think about what you said at the mic. Um, and he said, of course. And I'd give him the hard, you know, I'd give him the full Staley as he was giving me the full Fauci. <laughs> and, uh, and, that, and that became the basis of this kind of new level of friendship and relationship where I started giving him advice on an ongoing basis throughout the rest of the year. Um, and uh, for better, you know, I, you know, 
if it, I, I, I personally feel if I played some small role in having him survive that year, then for me it's something I'm intensely proud of because January 21st of 2021, one man was still at his government desk and one man mm. wasn't. Uh, so Tony Fauci survived Donald Trump. Um, and actually became far more important uh, during the next administration to fighting COVID. And uh, he's still doing that now. And I, I want to ask I, you... Um, we, are, we all should be very thankful for that. Yeah. I, I want to ask you, Peter, about uh, how the U.S., but actually overall public health community leadership has done in tackling the global response. Because... You know, here is something that we really thought we did learn from HIV and where, frankly, activism was, we just would not have been able to do this with activists um, in, in you know, former ACT UP folk who moved to, to South Africa and Uganda, um, Ugandan and South African activists who frankly, are much greater leaders than we would, would ever be and, and showed us how to shut up appropriately. But also activists inside the WHO and briefly, in, in my case, inside the pharmaceutical industry and then, you know, with, with the late ambassador Richard Holbrook setting the, the Global Business Coalition up. But this time round, we cannot seem to get it together. Um, and it seems that, that Tony is increasingly anxious about the state of the the global response are you, are you getting that sense definitely but uh and this is the major beef we're having with uh the administration now uh what we saw with aids after we finally had uh, the big breakthrough of the drug cocktails that could save everyone's life um, in 1996, we had we entered a disgraceful period in the crisis uh, of at least seven years, where those drugs were not available to the rest of the world, hmm. um, and uh, not until the launch of PEPFAR did we begin to make a dent on the global scale uh, in 2003 and beyond that. So that delay, you're, right, you're talking millions and millions of lives, deaths happening during those years. The bulk of AIDS deaths were actually happened after we had these drugs to save everyone's lives. And that, that is a, a great stain on the history of pandemic control in world history, especially if you have a tool and you don't use it. Yeah. And we have the same thing happening now with COVID. We have these miracle drugs, and they are true miracle drugs. Some of the most effective vaccines ever developed, developed faster than mankind has ever developed a technology like these. And uh, they're, they're be only being used in wealthy countries, period, full stop. We have yet to vaccinate uh, five percent of South Africans. Mm. So it's it's a an, a world disgrace. It's happening like COVID. Everything with COVID happens faster. It's happening on a shorter timeline, but the millions of deaths are still occurring. Um, and the U.S. deserves a huge lion's share of the blame for this because we actually have all the tools not just the technology, which was invented at the NIH. It was not invented at Moderna or, frankly, not even at Pfizer. Pfizer copycatted what the NIH did. Uh, and, and, I mean, that's not been widely published, but uh, uh, they basically copycatted what the NIH did. So both, both mRNA vaccines were discovered uh, at NIAID 
And uh, so we have great intellectual property control over these, and we have refused to use them. And we have all the government tools like marching rights and, and various things that the U.S. military uses all the time to get things done when a war is happening. Uh, but uh, and, but Peter, and, Peter, and let me not, ask you. And they're you. not doing it. Yeah, and let me ask you about what we're doing now. Boosters. Do you stand with Dr. Tedros in supporting the boycott of boosters? Dr. Tedros at the WHO. Um, I, I probably would not, uh, but uh, only, only in a different reality, in the sense that if we, if the Biden administration had done what the AIDS activists had asked of them, the COVID activists, excuse me, had asked of them in January, which was to uh, really take charge of global mRNA production, uh, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had to pick and choose between boosting Americans and vaccinating South Africans. We could do both. We could be boosting but, South Africans now. But that is where we are. And this idea we that are. we can chew gum and run at, run at the same time, that, that's just not working. Yeah, yeah. So, so look, I do have a, 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 a question. I've been really meaning to ask you, I think since the mid-1990s, when, when I first got to see and hear about you, uh, and then in fact meet you, um, I was in the UK, I was in London, and, you know, for us there, our American brothers and sisters, of course, seemed, you know, rather outrageous. But it dawned on me um, that, in fact, you were using tactics that had actually been used in some similar way a few years earlier um, by the disabled movement. And, you know, we've talked about oh. David France's um, documentary. We've spoken about Janet Tobias's Fauci documentary. It, to me, it's so interesting that all of this is about documentary. Have you seen Crip Camp? Crip Camp? And, and, and were you aware of their activism? Uh, and, and did this affect you consciously? Uh, I did see Crip Camp early on um, and was blown away uh, uh, at not being aware uh, of this uh, extraordinary body of activism uh, and realizing that, oh my God, you know, ACT UP gobbles up all this credit for being the first patient advocates. <laughs> and we weren't. Uh, there was a movement before us that really paved the way and uh, uh, up against extraordinary, uh, extraordinary odds uh, with fewer numbers, frankly, of uh, people being able to take to the streets and um, because of their disabilities. So, uh, you know, just gorgeous, gorgeous. And it, everyone has to see Crip Camp. Yeah. It's required viewing. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, it it, it, it really affected me. Interestingly, it, that both films, How to Survive a Plague and Crip Camp, uh, share a uh, uh, producer. So um, Howard, Howard uh, I'm going blank on Howard's name. He's going to kill me. But uh, uh, so they, they have similar partners behind both projects, people that like to really put activism on screen. Um, you right. know, to inspire other activists. I, I, I hadn't known that. And we will we'll put Howard's name into the show notes. So yes, thank you. Neither, of us are in, neither of us are embarrassed. So, so now's the time I really want to talk about PTSD. And there is a moment in Janet Tobias's Fauci where he stops and he can't quite speak for a second. And you can, there's a tear in his eye. And I don't quite know what the the director says to him, but he says, mm, PTSD. That, for any of us working for a long time in HIV, that's been uh, an experience that I think we have had to share, often, often quite quietly, often, I think, silently. Do you feel that this fury at the COVID moment 
has enabled us to speak more openly about the PTSD that we all went through? Probably. Um, sorry, the light is changing in my apartment with the sunlight hitting. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, and I think, I think the whole, it's, it's remarkable how the whole world is going through some PTSD in regard to the shutdowns that happened in, uh, with, with COVID, uh, in a sense, I, I wouldn't rank it the same. Um, certainly if you lost a loved one, uh, you could rank it the same, but, um, uh, uh, it, it was certainly triggered, uh, as, as this started by a lot of us fearing that, uh, here we go again. And, uh, uh, very hard to watch. Very hard yeah. to watch. So, so to wrap it up and, and to try and sort of bring this to a, a, a sort of a lighter, a lighter moment. How, how have you been coping with shutdown? What, what books have you read? Have, what Netflix series, is, uh, series <laughs> have you been binge watching? Or, you know, young person that I am in heart, how many games have you played online? Yeah. I'm not a game player online because um, uh, I've always been scared of that because I, I figure I'd become addicted and that would gobble up way too much time. Um, I, I did get lucky. Uh, I'm one of the lucky ones for uh, the shutdown in the sense that uh, two of my dearest friends who rent a house near me here in Pennsylvania, um, uh, they, you know, uh, like many who had a, uh, second place to live outside of New York chose to move out of the city during COVID and, and spend full time. So we became a pod. Um, and I ended up seeing them every night for nine months. And I, we'd shuttle between our two houses and cook and stream together. We'd watch series together. Um, so I ended up more social <laughs> than I used to because normally I'd have my weeks to myself mm. and I would see them every weekend and others uh, and but and we did you know it's a 75 year old straight woman uh, Laura Pinsky who oh. is uh, a dear AIDS activist since before ACT UP she she got things going at Columbia University in the mid mid 80s Um and another gay guy myself who's uh, si happily single, uh, Robert LaFosse, another HIV positive gay mm -hmm. man, uh, who is one of the great ballet stars uh, in the U.S. with New York City Ballet in the 1980s. Every, every, anybody who follows ballet knows his name. And uh, so the three of us, we just adore each other. And we got through nine months with, like I think, one argument. <laughs> <laughs> We just totally enjoyed each other's company. We would walk, take long walks through the woods with the dogs. We got, we both, we all got upped our game as far as cooking. And, uh, and we saw all the great series everyone else was watching. Uh, so go on, uh, name one, go on. Succession is one of my favorite oh, and, yeah. and that's back on now. I know. And, and so we're, we're binge watching that. And, um, uh, oh, what was the, the one with uh, uh, the one with chess? The woman who won at, at the chess championship. Oh yes, yeah, again. That was, yeah. We'll put that in the notes because I can't remember that. We haven't <laughs> binged watched it yet. But while, while I'm thinking about it, uh, Laura Laura Pinsky has played uh, quite an important role in my life in recent years as we have looked at strategies to support. Um, uh, human rights refugees coming, LGBT refugees coming from Russia um, and coming into the US. So she's she's very, very close to my heart. Yeah, uh, she's an amazing uh, person and friend. I feel very blessed to have her in my throuplet, as we called it. <laughs> 
So, Peter, we've reached the top of the hour, and I ask this question of everyone. My husband, Eric, is shaking his head in disbelief that I could even do this, uh, particularly ask you this question, but what is your favorite Pet Shop Boys song? <laughs> uh, I didn't know you had these end questions. I would have prepared. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Because uh, I don't know the titles, I just had them swimming in my head. Oh, um, good one, good one. <laughs> but the, but but boy, they were the they definitely were the soundtrack uh, for a lot of age activism in the in the nineties. Weren't they? Uh, yeah, they they absolutely were, um, and they're still going, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. totally, totally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Concerts with New Order happening as soon as social uh, distancing allows. Um, but that's a really good one. You know, it's not the names of the songs, it's the sounds in my head. I I'll, I'll grant you that, that, yeah. that works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Peter, is there anything that we've missed? Anything that you think our viewers and listeners ought to know? No, uh, but, but thank you, Ben, uh, for, you know, covering HIV AIDS, uh, year after year and, and for being in this fight and now COVID um, and for standing up for science. Um, if there's anything I can impart on people is science is under siege. The Tony Fauci's of the world are under total siege. Uh, um, and we have to be there for them. We have to stand up for science. We have to become a new vanguard to uh, or the world is or we're all screwed if 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 the conspiracy theorists win if the enemies of science win um then uh, mankind will will definitely uh uh snuff itself out yeah a a poignant and a clarion call to action peter thank you um, Peter, you are a shot in the arm. <laughs> thanks, Ben. Great spending time with you. Thank you. So, our thanks to Peter Staley and good luck with Never Silent. Thanks to Eric Espera, our director and producer from Newsdoc Media. Thanks also to Troy Espera, our digital producer. And thanks also to you for watching and listening. Have a great week and a safe week, everyone.